Hello everyone and welcome to module 5. In module 5 we'll talk about developing research questions and writing an introduction. Um, the chapters that you read for this week uh, or will read for this week are uh, chapters 4 and 5. Um, chapter 5 uh, is a lot of what we're covering in the lecture, expanding on that uh, quite a bit and talking about research questions and hypotheses. Um, and thinking about the, the writing up, up of those questions and the rationale behind those questions. What we're not going to cover much in the lecture is chapter four. Um, chapter four outlines uh, the role of theory um, in our research more generally, some common uh, theories that are used to understand uh, social um, factors, behavioral uh, change, things like that. Um, so it's important to read. Uh, the one thing that I will say and sort of emphasize about the content of chapter four is the importance of evaluating the kind of evidence that is most appropriate uh, for what you are interested in. Um, there aren't necessarily hard and fast rules about this kind of evidence is appropriate for this kind of research. Uh, there are some um, matches between the kind of evidence you would need for the kinds of questions that you're asking or the kind of claims that you want to make. Um, but it's really important to be able to think about um, how strong that evidence is, the design. Uh, it's a big part of the reason that we, that you all are learning research methods, even if you might not go on to actually conduct research, because you want to use that research to inform your practice, and so you have to be able to evaluate that evidence. So you want to think both about um, the quality of that evidence and the appropriateness of that evidence for your research questions uh, and for your purposes for uh, you know if you're designing an intervention or an education program um, and evaluating that evidence that would inform uh, the lesson plan or the intervention design or something like that um, so that is all that i will say about that particular topic uh, and then we'll focus the rest of this lecture on developing research questions and writing an introduction so let's move on to talk about developing a research question um, as we talked about in module three, choosing a topic is the first step. And so this is where you're going to do a ton of reading. You'll collect articles using the literature review strategies we talked about in module three, and you'll spend a lot of time with the literature. You'll then think about defining and redefining and redefining and redefining your research question. Um, so there are a a variety of strategies you can use to do this for your topic area. You can write down everything you know about that topic based on your reading in the literature. Um, you certainly may uh, insert some of your knowledge from your own practice or experiences in there, um, but you really should be thinking about what we know from the literature. Your research question is a conversation with the literature. Uh, write out the answers to the questions who, what, when, where, and why, how, so what, uh, what if, and use the information that you've written down to identify gaps in the literature. And as you try and move from your topic to your question and think about rationalizing uh, that question, think about filling in the phrase, I am studying blank because I want to find out who, what, when, where, whether, why, how blank in order to help my reader understand how, why, whether blank. Um, so that may be a good formula just to help you think about moving back and forth between topic and question and uh, redefining your research question uh, for the uh, research question assignment that you'll turn in um, to develop your research question for the research proposal for this course. Um, for many of you, what you turn in as your first question may not be your final question. And that's one of the reasons uh, I ask you to do it early on in the semester so that you don't turn in a final paper uh, wherein I identify some flaw in the research question or um, some way in which that research question could be revised uh, to, to better contribute to the literature. So um, that will be a, a work in progress uh, to a great degree. And so again, thinking about all of the, the strategies and, and ideas I said for defining and redefining your research question, a reminder that your research question must be based on the literature, not just what, about what you think is true in the world. I recognize that you all come to this uh, with a variety of clinical experiences, practice experiences, uh, life experiences, um, but your research question is a conversation with the literature. Um, it is the connection between your research and existing research. And research questions should be, uh, not surprisingly, a well-worded question. Um, the question should imply the possibility of empirical testing. So the question should be a question that can be answered using research. 
Um, so you may want to be specific uh, about the variables that you're looking at. You may want to operationalize the variables. I'll give you some examples of um, some levels of specificity in a moment. Um, think about what kinds of evidence you'll need to answer your question, if that evidence is even feasible to obtain. Um, and a, a quick check of that is to turn your question into a hypothesis. So be able to turn that question into a statement that you can say is ultimately true or false via the research that you conduct. So again, that question should suggest a relationship to be examined between an independent variable and a dependent variable. There may be other variables in there, control variables, mediators, moderators. I'll say more about variables in the next slide. Um, and your independent and dependent variables should be clear in that question. I should be able to look at that question. Your reader should be able to look at that question and identify your independent and dependent variables solely based on that one sentence. So let's do a quick uh, review of variables. I think your book does a pretty nice job of covering the definitions of these, um, but I think this is something that students often struggle to keep straight. So independent variables in experimental research, I think these are easy to remember. They are the factors that we manipulate. So maybe it's an intervention condition. Uh, so we have a control condition versus the intervention condition where they receive our uh, education program or, um, or what have you. Uh, in non-experimental research, I think people get a little bit more confused because these are not variables that we ever manipulate necessarily. Um, these are variables that we examine as predictors of other variables. So for example, if we're examining gender differences, uh, gender would be our independent variable because we think some other variable depends on gender. Uh, it could be individual characteristics like self-esteem if we think self-esteem predicts some other uh, outcome or some other variable. Conversely, dependent variables are what we think of as our outcome variables. And I think an easy way to remember this one are that uh, dependent variables are variables that we think may depend on some other variable, on our independent variable. And so there are some variables that can never be dependent variables, like biological sex or race. Um, we can never say that uh, one's current level of self-esteem will predict whether or not they are biologically male or female. That's not possible. Um, or whether they are white, black, uh, whatever. So there um, are some variables that we just can't think about as dependent variables. Um, there are some other uh, higher levels of analyses in which we flip this to some degree, um, but our dependent variables are still things that we think will depend on our independent variables. So I'm going to cover mediating and moderating variables fairly quickly here. Your book does not talk about this, uh, and I find this to be one of the most challenging things for students to understand. Um, I actually remember the moment that I finally understood the distinction between mediators and moderators. So I don't want you to go crazy um, trying to keep these straight, but I do think they're important concepts to understand. So mediating variables are variables that we think may mediate an association between an independent and a dependent variable. So for example, in the literature, we know that gender is associated with drug use. So men tend to be um, more likely to use drugs, heavier users of drugs when they do use drugs. Um, and so we want to think about what causes that association. Why do we see that gender difference between um, men and women on drug use? So what we may look at um, as a mediating variable perhaps is sensation seeking. So maybe it's that men are higher in sensation seeking. They go out and look for stimulation, um, sensation more than women do. Again, these are all on average. Uh, there's obviously a tremendous amount of individual variability in these. Um, and so maybe sensation seeking is actually what's driving the difference or the, this gender difference or this association between gender and substance use. So maybe it's that um, gender is associated with sensation seeking such that men are higher and women are lower. And sensation seeking actually then goes on to explain drug use, which we know is true from the literature. So mediating variables are variables that help explain an association between an independent and dependent variable. They mediate or go between that association. Moderating variables, on the other hand, are variables that we think may influence or change an association between an independent and a dependent variable. So using a similar example, um, we can say, let's say we know from the literature that there is an association broadly between depression and drug use. 
So people who are more depressed use drugs more frequently or are more likely to use drugs at all. But maybe we actually find out that this is different for men and women. And this could be for a variety of reasons. So maybe uh, women are more likely to use drugs uh, to cope with negative emotions, whereas men are more likely to use drugs for sensation-seeking kinds of purposes. And so what we see when we look at this association between depression and drug use separately for men and women is that for men, there's not that association. Depression is not associated with drug use at all, but for women, there is a strong positive association between depression and drug use such that more depression uh, leads to more drug use. So we would say that gender would moderate or change the association between depression and drug use. I can uh, post some articles if, if you guys are particularly uh, interested in understanding these distinctions. Um, again, I think these are really challenging for students to understand, uh, so don't make yourself too crazy um, trying to figure this out. And then your book talks about variables that we may want to control for, uh, either in our experimental design or statistically after the fact, um, and extraneous or confounding variables. And these are also variables that we may want to control for um, and try and remove the influence of um, so that we can look at a more pure association between our independent and dependent variables. So that's a quick sort of uh, 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 segue into talking about variables, but I think they're, they're really key to being able to develop a clear research question, so I wanted to spend a little bit more time on them. So when we talk about quantitative research questions, uh, we can broadly break these research questions up into three different kinds of research questions. The first are descriptive. They are questions that um, wherein we want to describe a phenomenon. So what are the sexual health practices of low-income adolescents in Philadelphia, for example? Um, and in this situation, we probably want to do a little bit more um, specification and operationalization. So what would count as low-income uh, what counts as adolescence? Uh, what, can, what are we looking at in terms of sexual health practices? Are we looking at HIV testing? Are we looking at condom use? Are we looking at birth control? Are we looking at all of those? Some composite of the three STI outcomes. Um, so again, you see how the specificity here is really important. Um, this may be a good sort of broad uh, research question, uh, descriptive research question, but we wanna be more specific than that when we're developing an actual research question. Another type of research question is one in which we want to compare. Uh, typically, this is comparing groups. So, for example, how do the sexual health practices of low-income adolescent girls compare to the sexual health practices of low-income adolescent boys? Um, or how do the sexual health practices of adolescents receiving treatment as usual, and when we say treatment as usual, we mean whatever they would get when they would go to their doctor. Um, so maybe that's a pamphlet. Um, how do the sexual health practices of adolescents receiving treatment as usual compare to the sexual health practices of adolescents receiving my amazing evidence-based intervention that I have developed and tested um, in this population? So this is a situation in which we want to compare groups. So they may be naturally occurring groups like gender, they may be groups that we have manipulated like experimental condition, but in these kinds of questions we're comparing uh, two or more groups. And the third type, really broadly, of quantitative research questions are questions that relate variables or constructs. So these can be phrased in a variety of ways, um, as can the comparison questions. So for example, to what extent does socioeconomic status relate to adolescent sexual health practices? And again, we would want to think uh, more specifically, so what are we using as metrics of socioeconomic status? Are we using some broad metric that includes parental education, current income, um, education, you know, uh, social capital, etc. Um, and then again, what are we talking about when we say sexual health practices? Um, we could say, to what extent does socioeconomic status uh, relate to adolescent sexual health practices controlling for the effects of educational attainment? So removing the effects of education on sexual health practices what's the association between socioeconomic status and adolescent sexual health practices? Um, or how does mother's education level influence timing of sexual initiation? It's a much more specific question where we're looking very specifically at mother's education level, 
and uh, how old somebody is when they have their first sexual experience. Um, we probably want to define sexual experience. Do we mean penile vaginal sex? Do we mean any kind of sexual activity? Um, so this gives you a sense of, of these broad types of quantitative research questions that we're typically looking at. So as you think about developing your research question for the research proposal, think about where this fall, where your question falls in, um, and then how you want to word your question based on how this, uh, what kind of a question it is. That language is incredibly important and a lot of what I'll be um, helping you with uh, as you develop your research question. Qualitative research questions, which your book doesn't talk much about, uh, these are often more broad than quantitative research questions. Uh, they also may evolve more over the course of the research process, though certainly when you're writing it up, you should probably give a sense of, of that uh, process of change if there were in fact a lot of changes in your research question. So for example, how do low-income adolescents describe managing sexual health with limited resources? It's a little bit more specific, um, but also incredibly broad in thinking about uh, sexual health practices or managing sexual health. Um, and resources. We may go down a variety of avenues when we're thinking about resources in this situation. What are adolescents' experiences of my amazing evidence-based intervention? Um, so that's again a, a much more broad question um, to get their perspective on how they experienced and moved through an intervention. Um, and as I said in the beginning, uh, these different kinds of evidence may be important for different kinds of reasons. So for example, you may find that your intervention was actually uh, fairly effective, um, that we saw changes in there, um, but changes at least in the sexual health practices. But what we didn't realize uh, was that it made adolescents feel terrible about themselves. Um, maybe it made them uh, drop out of the intervention early uh, for some of them. And so that may be incredibly important information and evidence as we think about moving forward with an intervention. So different kinds of evidence are, are relevant or important for different kinds of questions or practices. So once we have developed our research question, um, which is the core of any introduction, um, let's talk a little bit about what writing an introduction looks like. So the purpose of the introduction is to obviously first establish the topic area. Um, it sets up the problem uh, in the world that we're addressing with this introduction, um, and it tells the reader why that problem is important. So again, answering this famous, so what question. Um, I should finish, any reader should finish an introduction and say, oh, well, that's obviously important. I mean, certainly you may read an introduction and say, I guess that's important, but not to me. Um, but you should have a sense that that problem is important in the world in some way. And really, your introduction should make the study that is being reported on, the study that you're talking about, seem to be the, uh, an obvious next step in understanding that. Um, this is also a place where you introduce any theoretical frameworks you may be using to structure your research or interpret your findings. And I think uh, figure 5.4 in your book does a nice job of giving an outline of the introduction. Um, for our purposes in writing the research proposal, uh, we won't have the part about delimitations uh, and limitations and things like that. Um, we'll have sort of the first part of that introduction leading up into the research question. Um, and some level of operationalization, but I think that figure does a nice job of, of giving you a sense of what the outline of an introduction should look like. And uh, your book also gives you um, sort of the, the first part of this uh, hourglass figure in terms of thinking about how we narrow down an introduction. And so um, we often begin very broadly. This is an example based on an article that I wrote in uh, 2011 that I'm happy to post if it's useful to you guys as you read um, through this outline and, uh, and think about structuring the introduction. But we want to begin really broadly. So my research more broadly is about substance use and sexual risk behavior, uh, particularly among gay and bisexual men. Uh, this was written for a very public health journal, so men who have sex with men is, is more of the language that we use in public health. So begin very broadly, decades of research demonstrate an association between substance use and sexual risk behavior, particularly among uh, men who have sex with men. Um, as we become more specific, we can also start to identify what the gap in the literature is. So there's a bunch of mechanisms by which that may occur, but we're still not entirely sure how that happens, why there's that association in the world. 
And so to better understand that association, I'm going to integrate two different theories regarding the association between substance use and sexual risk in an exploratory attempt to improve our understanding of the mechanisms underlying sexual risk behavior under the influence. So that sort of guides you through how you move uh, from broad to more specific in the introduction. Um, and for the purposes of this course, we'll only write the introduction. Um, the methods and results are obviously very specific to your study. And then as you move back towards the discussion, you move back towards a more broad um, discussion of your findings. So these results provide support for the importance of integrating the concepts of these theories that I talked about in this paper, demonstrating that individuals experiencing conflict may be more sensitive to the effect of expectancies than those who are not. That obviously doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you. Don't worry about that, uh, the content so much. Um, and then the broader conclusions are that by finding specific pairings of conflict and expectancies that best predict sexual risk behavior under the influence, practitioners can tailor intervention and prevention efforts to these pairings that are most prevalent in various communities. So um, again, starting really big, this is an issue in this community, uh, substance use and sexual risk behavior. And so here's what I'm going to do. Here's what these findings mean. And again, here's how they relate back to that big main issue. So um, the first part is just really this narrowing in. Um, and as you move through the process, you'll um, become more broad as you go through your discussion. So your introduction should answer a variety of questions. Hopefully those should be clear to you based on the last couple of slides and the chapter. Um, why is your topic important? Whether that's for public health, social work, education, psychology, clinical practice, or some other field or practical application. Um, and how did the literature lead you to your research question? I think this is where a lot of students get stuck. This is much more than a literature review. Um, instead, you'll be using the literature to build to your research question. So it's a very strategic use of the literature. Um, and so you may not be covering all of the relevant studies. Uh, you may want to identify some that, um, that don't go along with your logic uh, that you've been developing so far. Um, but really, you're using the research to make it uh, so that when you get to your research question, your reader says, oh, of course that's the research question. That makes complete sense. Um, and you'll also uh, identify the gap in the literature that your research will fill. Um, so here's been all the research that's been done so far. Here's what's missing. And then here is obviously my question. And then finally, your question. So a few uh, introduction writing tips, um, again, begin broadly and get more specific. So really hold the reader's hand and lead them into the specific issues in the literature. Uh, hook the reader early to avoid confusion and demonstrate the importance of your paper. So early on, answer the so what question. Um, write for both the lay and experienced readers. So you don't want to use overly technical, hard to read jargon, um, even people who may be more experienced in your field. Uh, may not love reading that, so try and balance your need to, um, to sound smart and to appeal to uh, more experienced readers in your field um, with being able to write for people who may not have that level of expertise in your particular field. Um, that will help your results have much broader impact, your paper have a much broader impact than it would otherwise. And I'll talk more about this in a second as well, but avoid bland and redundant regurgitation. So, um, you want to really link concepts and ideas together. So that may involve reading it all, putting it aside, uh, paraphrasing, and then citing it. Uh, don't just list the details of every article that you've read that you think is relevant. That's an annotated bibliography. Um, Daryl Bum said, think about uh, the introduction as a short story, short story with a single linear narrative line. Um, so again, I think about this, I think about the introduction in a lot of ways as a persuasive writing exercise. Um, you really want to use this literature to persuade your reader that your research question is the obvious uh, and, uh, and good uh, research question to pursue. So some common mistakes are not synthesizing the literature. This gets to the last point on the last side. Um, so just giving laundry lists of articles. Uh, this is sometimes called stacked abstracts. So here's everything about this association. This paper found this, then this paper found this, then this paper found this. If I wanted to know that, I could go and do my own literature search and read all of those abstracts. Uh, so you really want to be able to synthesize the literature and use it to make your point and not just give me a laundry list of findings. 
uh, you want to make sure that you're covering, uh, that you're not covering irrelevant literature or irrelevant aspects of relevant literature. Um, and as you move forward and work on your outline and ultimately your paper for this course, um, I'll do a lot of feedback that will help you um, understand what pieces are relevant and what pieces are not. Um, so a lot of folks feel like every time they introduce a study, they have to give every detail about it. So this is how many participants, this is how they were recruited, um, these are their ages, etc. Um, and unless those details are relevant for the point that you're making, uh, then uh, you don't necessarily need to include them. Um, I think that is something that students feel like, oh gosh, I can't leave out that information, it's really important, and I need to demonstrate that I read the article. Um, if it's relevant, so maybe you're looking, uh, for example, at uh, gay bisexual men in your research, and there's a really important finding that you want to highlight, but it's only been found in heterosexual populations. And so you may want to say, um, here's this really interesting finding, but it's only been demonstrated in heterosexual samples. And so my contribution to the literature is understanding this particular association in a different population. Uh, another common mistake is making inaccurate conclusions. Uh, that may be because of a lack of understanding of the literature. Uh, this is, I think, in some cases because of a self-confirming bias. So this is what I think is true in the world. And I'm now going to read every article with that lens and try and make that study fit into what I think is true in the world. And so somehow I'm going to develop some convoluted understanding of these results to make it work with the idea that I have in my head already. And so uh, wh whatever experience, life, work, whatever that you're coming to a topic with, you have to be willing to read the literature and think about um, changing the understanding of those associations or group differences or whatever. Um, and I think a lack of understanding is also sometimes the case uh, in making inaccurate conclusions. And we can talk more about that as we go through the article review. Um, and I'll give you feedback on how to better understand the literature. Another common mistake is not properly searching for literature, so conducting a slim literature review, uh, including literature, again, that's not relevant or that's outdated. Uh, for some of you, the topic may be not terribly well researched, and so you may find a lot of studies from the 80s or you know, even the early 90s uh, that may be key articles in your field that you need to cover or cite. Um, but uh, you really should think about making sure that a good chunk of the articles that you talk about are fairly recent articles. Um, certainly, uh, the, the conversation that we have in the literature continues to move forward. And so you don't want to cite something from 1993 as a key piece of your argument, uh, only to find out that in 1999, and again in 2007, and again in 2009, uh, a ton of research actually found something totally different using better methods, analyses, whatever. Um, so really make sure that you use research uh, and literature that is current. Tips for improving your writing. I wish I had something better to tell you, but read, read, write, write, and uh, get a ton of feedback. So this is me grading. Um, and so hopefully through the course of uh, this semester, you will be able to improve your lit review skills, uh, your research thinking skills, and uh, your ability to develop research questions, and also your basic writing skills. Um, this is a key piece of being able to write introductions, uh, is to have some basic writing skills in here as well. So a quick overview of the research question assignment. Uh, as noted in the assignment, you'll write a paragraph that utilizes some of the literature. You don't have to have a full literature review here, but utilizes the literature to lead into and support your research question. Um, you'll conclude that paragraph with your clearly articulated research question. Again, I want to know what your independent and dependent variables are just from looking at that question. The grading rubric for this is on Campus Cruiser, uh, and as always, if you have questions, thoughts, uh, specific questions to you, certainly email me, but other um, broad questions post under the general discussion forum. Thank you.